there is nothing greater than seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in our heart. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. This is the desire of, of, uh, of, the, of his saint. To reach out and touch him. I want to reach out to him and touch him. To show him that I love him. Open my ears, Lord. I, and help me to listen to the voice of the one who is the creator of the whole universe. And help me to listen. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. Seeing Jesus is the climax of Christian life. What a wonderful thing it is. We should have this wonderful desire in our heart. And if we have this desire, the Lord will reveal himself to us. And we will see him in our heart. And when we see him, we will be satisfied. What a wonderful thing it is. When we see him, we will, be, we will, we will have the glory of the Lord in our lives. When we see him, we will have the, a wonderful desire to walk according to the word. Know his word more clearly and walking according to his word. And when we see him, you will really have the desire to walk on the path he went. When we see him, We will have the wonderful, wonderful privilege of falling at his feet and worshipping him as Mary did that. What a wonderful thing it is. So we should have the desire, Lord, I want to see my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved me to such an extent of giving his only life, giving his wonderful uh, life, glorious life, for me, so that I can have that glory in my life and I can bask in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is so wonderful. This evening we will just try to understand the letter of Paul to Colossian church. Paul wrote this letter to the uh, church at Colossae. Only four chapters are there. But this, uh, this letter has a great depth in the riches of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul wrote this letter mm -hmm. around 62 to 63 AD. And Paul directed the Colossian church, to share this letter with the church at Laodicea also, chapter 4, verse 16, we read that. Tychicus and Onesimus were the bearer of this letter to letters like Philemon, Ephesians and Colossians, which were written and delivered at the same time. As we read, read Ephesians chapter 6, we understand this. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 to 9. Philemon, verse 11, uh, 12 and 23 to 24. We, we will understand this fact. The occasion for, he, for this writing. I'm just teaching you uh, the things step by step. The, what is the occasion for for the for his writing to Colossians? The immediate occasion for writing this letter was because of the heresy in the church. Ephesus reported to Paul the false views and evil practices in the church at that time. If you read chapter one, verses seven and eight, and chapter two verse 8 to 23. You will understand this. And this passage describes 
these things rather explicitly. Among the heresies involved were, when we read chapter 2 verse 11, there we read like this, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by circumcision of Christ. He is talking about the circumcision. Circumcision was a, a, a law in the people of uh, Israel. Every male child should be circumcised. What is the meaning of circumcision? That he is sanctified to God. That is the meaning of circumcision. This is very, very important. And uh, chapter 2, verse 14, the, uh, uh, Paul says here, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. See, look at that. What did Jesus do? He, he nailed the letter of accusation, which was against us, to the cross when he died there. Or in other words, he, he has cancelled the letter of accusation which was against us on the cross of Calvary. And certain ordinances, man-made ordinances, he, which was against us, which was contrary to us, and the Lord Jesus took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And then what did he do? Verse 15 of chapter 2, there we see, and having spoiled the principalities and powers, having defeated the, uh, defeated the armies of the principalities and powers, he made a sh great, uh, great exhibit of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Or he cancelled the ordinances, the written ordinances, and which was against us and he nailed it to the cross. What was against us? The ordinances. Ordinances were, were proclaiming that you are guilty before the Lord. See the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Man is a sinner by birth and sinner by deeds and the wages of sin is death. That was the ordinances eh, against us. The Lord Jesus Christ, he took, it to, took that ordinance and he nailed it to the cross when he hung on the cross of Calvary. And what did he do? Verse 15, this is very, very wonderful. And he defeated the armies of the principalities and powers. He made a show of public display, triumphing over them on the cross. He defeated the armies of the adversary and he, he defeated, he nailed the letter of uh, condemnation which was against us to the cross of Calvary and thereby he has given us the redemption. What a wonderful thing it is. He made that on the cross of Calvary. See, and then we read about chapter 2 verse 16. There were some restrictions about food, holidays and so forth. He removed all that hurdles when he died on the cross of Calvary. A severe asceticism, if you read chapter 2 verse 16, eh, look at that, there we read. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. 
So all that thing, he nailed it to the cross. Look at that. And chapter 2, verse 18. Eh? What Paul says here, hmm? Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. See, whatever that was, uh, you know, whatever that was um, shaped in his mind, hmm, worshipping of angels, so many things, that everything he put it on the cross of Calvary. Whatever that that uh, that came out of the fleshly mind. See, look at that. See, that is the worship of angels. He's, uh, he removed it. Glorification and worship of human knowledge. Chapter 2, verse 8. There we see, Paul says very clearly to the Colossian church. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy or vain Deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Whatever the tradition, whatever the rudiments or the system which was not according to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, so it was only according to the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, He has nailed it to the cross of Calvary. Traditions he has taken away. God hates traditions. This is very, very important. In many of the churches, these traditions are, are followed. The humanly tradition. There is no, huh, there is no spiritual admonition or the spiritual enlightenment in the churches. There are only human tradition, human, uh, 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 human rudiments, human rules and regulations are followed. Church is the body of Christ. This is what the Bible says. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church. If he really is the head of the church, uh, the church would follow the instructions and uh, and the spiritual uh, uh, spiritual realities in their life. Because head, if the head is the Lord Jesus Christ, all the, uh, and the all the members of the body will follow what the head says. That's why church, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ should be the head of the church. It's not the pastor. The Lord Jesus Christ, the pastor is led by the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor is only an instrument of revealing the mind of the Lord which was revealed to him, to the people. This is the pastor's duty to tell the reality, to lead the people in the spiritual life, free spiritual relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the church. Denomination is not the church. Church is a reality that uh, the believers, the uh, people who are washed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ are joined together to the Lord Jesus Christ and they listen to the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the Holy Word of God and walking according to that. If you do not walk according to the Holy Word of God, you cannot be Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever big it may be, whatever the name may be. If you do not follow the word of God verbatim as it is, you are not 
belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not the church. Absolutely true. So you examine your, uh, your, about your church. Whether your church where you are attending is following the word of God verbatim as it is. Because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word is God. That's what the Bible says. Who is Jesus Christ? None other than the holy word of God. So if you, uh, you, uh, you should listen to, you should be attached to the, to the head. If the body is not attached to the head, <laughs> the body will go haywire. Body should be attached to the head and the body should function as the head says. So in the same way, eh, the head of the church is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Word of God. And the church, the members of the church should go, follow, the, follow the direction of, from the head, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Then only there is a real church. Otherwise, any denominational churches, including believers, just some you will call, brethren assembly they call, so many things they will call. If they do not walk according to the word of God, they are not the church. The head of the church must be the Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God. That is absolutely sure. And we should take direction from the word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should walk according to the word of God. And the pastor is responsible to lead the people to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that the people may be attracted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they may, be, eh, they may be aware of the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is, who is the head of the church. Otherwise, that church, however big may be, <laughs> that cannot be the church of the living God. There are many people gathering in the churches. That cannot be the church at all. The church is... Eh, where two or three is gathered in my name, they are the church under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is absolutely clear in the word of God. See, let us examine ourselves. We may be going to some churches. Which, which is the church? Church is headed, the real church is the spiritual uh, spiritual entity and the head of the church is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the real word of God. And the church, uh, the believers, uh, uh, those who are in the church should walk according to the di direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means uh, they should follow the word of God verbatim. This is absolutely important. So we will understand who are the real church, who are not the church. Devil has his churches filled with people. They don't follow the word of God. Devil is the, devil is the arch enemy of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ crushed the head of the devil on the cross of Calvary. He made a, 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 he made a great triumph over the devil. So we should rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. Next one. I want to tell you what is the pattern of the uh, real church, the spiritual church. I told you church is the spiritual entity. It is a church is the bride church is the uh, you know uh, bride of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what the Bible says. It's a spiritual entity. 
You are gathering together eh, as the body of Christ and listening to the head of the church. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is absolutely, absolutely necessary. Paul was teaching this truth to the church at Colossians. And he says that this letter, yeah, you also share it to the church at Levadesia. In the first century itself, there were contradictions. There were many things. And number two, the pattern of the church. What is the pattern of the church? I have been telling you repeatedly, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. What do we read there? There are four things mentioned here. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. There we read like this. Listen to me very carefully. And they continued steadfastly. Look at that. They continued steadfastly. They did not jump from church to church. They continued steadfastly. Number one, in the apostle doctrine. What is that? The word of God. They continued, uh, uh, continued steadfastly on the holy word of God. See, the word of God should have the preeminence. That should be number one. Look at that. That is important. So in the church, there cannot be any other thing other than the word of God. That is number one. And the second one, look at that. They continued steadfastly in the fellowship of one another. See, I told you, see, church is the body of Christ. See, we look, uh, look into our bodies. Head, eyes, mouth, and hands, and legs, fingers, everything joined together in its place. Look at that. So fellowship of one another. Fellowship of one church. Look at that. Fellow, what is the meaning of fellowship? Sharing with each other. Sharing our good things to others. Sharing our spiritual experience to others. Fellowship. There should be fellowship in the church. If there is no fellowship, it cannot be a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three. What is number three? <laughs> and breaking of bread. What a wonderful thing it is. This is the, uh, this is the central theme of the church. What is the meaning of breaking of bread? Jesus he broke the bread before he went to the cross of Calvary. He broke the bread with his, with his people, with his disciples. That is the significance of the uh, 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 Lord Jesus Christ who was broken for our transgressions, who was broken for our iniquities as a substitute on the cross of Calvary. So that we can enter into the Holy of Holies. In the Jerusalem temple, there were three places. One, it is uh, outer court. And the next one is holy place. And after that, there is a curtain, a great curtain covered the most holy place. The climax of worship is entering into the most holy place. That was covered by a, a great curtain. Nobody has authority to enter into that holy place, most holy place. Only the high priest who was anointed, he should prepare himself. Hmm? He should cleanse himself, he should prepare himself. And he should take the blood of the sacrifice. And with all reverence, he should enter into the most holy place. According to the 
Jewish law. What do we read? That mo that high priest who was appointed for that purpose. When he enters into the most holy place, he should take the blood. Huh? What they what they will do now? See, they will tie a rope to his feet, ankle. And that rope was uh, to, uh, out in the um, first place. Okay? First place. And then comes the holy place. And then comes the most holy place. Suppose when the uh, high priest, when he was worshipping in the most holy place, eh, if the bells of his, uh, you know, uh, that, that uh, dress do not sound if the people do not hear the sound of the bells for a certain time that means the high priest was dead in the most holy place so he is dead huh. nobody can go inside they will also be dead. Uh, the, the, they will also be uh, dead. What they will do? When there was no ringing of the bells, the people in the outside, they will pull the rope and along with that, the dead body will come out. Look at that. That shows who can enter into the house most holy place only those whose transgression was forgiven those who are cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ hmm? what happened when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary the Bible says the, uh, the curtain which covered the most holy place was torn from top to bottom and the common man can now see the most holy place God has made us the great privileged people who are washed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ to enter into the holy of holies, the most holy place and praise him, adore him, worship him. This is so wonderful. This is so wonderful. What a privilege that God has given to his people. We can boldly enter into the most holy place Without any shadow of doubt. Without any nervous. Because of the blood of Jesus. Covered us. See that is important. What a wonderful pattern. Look at that. Breaking of bread. Is a wonderful wonderful pattern. It gives a clear picture. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who made. Us to enter into the most holy place. And worship him back. What a great privilege it is. A joyful worship. Will uh, ring up. And ascend into heaven. As we worship. The Lord Jesus Christ. In the most holy place. That is the breaking of bread. What is the fourth one? What do we read there? They continued steadfastly in prayers. What a wonderful thing it is. What a wonderful thing. How much we should praise Him. How much we should worship Him. He, they continued the uh, uh, apostles. They continued steadfastly in prayers. What a privilege we have. What a privilege we have. We can open up our hearts and say, Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, I put everything before you. Jesus said, all ye burdened and heavy laden, come unto me, I will give you rest. When you kneel down in the presence of the Lord, and pour out your heart. 
the Lord will remove all the burdens of your life. Mary, the mother of Jesus, she went into the presence of the Lord. Mary Magdalene, she sat at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and worshipped him, anointed his feet. What a wonderful picture! Some people say, you know, you know, you should keep quiet. You should not, women should not speak. But God has given them the privilege of worshipping the Lord. What a wonderful thing it is. Mary Magdalene, she sat at the feet of the Lord, what she was doing. She anointed the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he shed tears and she wiped the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ with the tears from her hair. That is a great worship. I'll tell you. See how, what about the Bible? What about our tradition? The devil is the one who introduces these traditions. Look at the Bible. Many women, they followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the life story of the Lord Jesus Christ. More than men, there were women who followed the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not have any knowledge of these things. We do not read our Bible. You may be having a good Bible, but you don't read it. And you who listen to someone else, that is none other than the devil who creates uh, 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 these uh, traditions. Because of your tradition, uh, Paul says, you have, uh, you have diluted the word of God. How much we should be thankful to God. There should be no tradition in the church except the word of God. Our worship should be biblical worship. God, eh, uh, we should worship the heavenly God, our Father in heaven, with all our heart, pouring our heart. If you are burdened so much, you know, you will really shed tears in the presence at the feet of the Lord Jesus. That is the wonderful worship I will tell you. How about your worship? Hmm? I have not seen this kind of worship in any denominational churches. Because they are following the uh, traditions introduced by the devil. What did the devil do? He took away the spiritual things. Because he knew that if the people worship according to the word of God, <laughs> he will have a great blow on his head. That's why he introduced uh, tradition, liturgy, so many things, so many other things. Reading. Reading the book other than the Bible. No book is holy in the entire literature of the universe except the Word of God. This stands you know, for eternity to eternity. Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Only this word changes the lives of the people. 
Only this word gives you the uh, hope of glory. Only this word points to only one person. The eternal God, the Lord Jesus Christ. No other book, no other order, no other pattern. See how wonderful it is. The pattern of the church is also mentioned in the Holy Bible. So, how we should be careful in our worship. If the pastor doesn't lead the people according to the pattern of the word, word of God, he is the agent of the devil. He is not the pastor at all. If you are really born again, if you are really sanctified by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, you will always point to the Holy Word of God. You will lead the people to the Word of God to read. Show the references and follow the pattern which was laid down. This pattern is for eternity to eternity. It cannot be changed. Nobody can change it. So, how important it is. How important it is. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> See, Paul admonishes. Paul warns the people against the glorification and worship of human knowledge. They were... Uh, uh, there were people who were excelled in their studies, maybe a PhD, doctorate in knowledge and other things. So, the, what does the devil do? Devil points out these people to the, to the people and guide them to huh, worshipping them, glorifying this knowledge. That is the work of the devil. Who is more knowledgeable? <laughs> Only one. That is our living God. The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the same yesterday, same today and same forever. What a wonderful thing it is. So, the, in, the, in the Colossian church, these are all things were there. Paul was attacking those things. Introduced by the devil. <laughs> what he emphasized in the uh, Colossians. In chapter 3, if you read, Christian living is emphasized. A life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the uh, very clear example for us. He said and he lived like that. Christian life is emphasized. What is Christian? Huh? What is C-H-R-I-S-T? I-A-N. Christ, number one. And the next letter is I. And next letter is A. I am. The last letter is N. Nothing. Christ. I am nothing. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It's not I, but Christ lives in me. What a wonderful thing it is. That is a Christian. Am I a Christian? If I am a Christian, Christ should be predominant in my life. I should come next. I am zero, nothing. So we, we, are, we are called to live a life projecting the Lord Jesus Christ. When we live that life, people who watch us, see us, they will see none other than Lord Jesus Christ. In my life, if, if the Lord Jesus Christ is projected, the people are attracted to the Lord Jesus Christ, not to me. It's not I, but Christ lives in me. This is the living. 
Eh? Chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 17. If you read that, what do we read there? We should live a Christ-like life in our personal life. Personal life. Nobody knows how you are. In my personal life, I should live a, live a life like Christ lived. Declining myself, rejecting myself, taking out that self-centeredness. I'm so and so, so and so. <laughs> I serve like this. I preach many places. No, not I, but Christ. Who is my, who is my lifestyle? The Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing. Christian life, in personal life we should read. And in domestic life, if you read chapter 3, verse uh, 18 onwards, Paul is writing to wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. See, look at that. Many husbands, you know, manipulate their wives in these days. I am, I am the, uh, you know, I am the lord of the house. And I am your husband. You should listen to what I, uh, what I say. And there were, uh, I know several families, several Christian families. Where wives have been battered like anything. Many wives I have seen shedding tears because of their husbands. This is the tragedy. What type of a Christian you are? What is, how is your domestic life? You go to the church. You say, sing hallelujah. Praise the Lord, you say. But what about your life with your own wife? This is absolutely we should examine ourselves. The Lord Jesus Christ should be seen in our domestic life. You read chapter 3, verse 18 onwards, up to chapter 4, verse 1. And then the third thing, in relation to the world, chapter 4, verse 7 to 18, you read that. Colossians chapter 4, verse uh, 7 to 18, Paul is writing uh, to all groups of people. What is my relation to the world? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Am I the right light of the world? Where well, we need light? In darkness. This world has fallen into darkness. And we as children of God washed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, when we walk among those people, they should see the light of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is absolutely necessary. What a wonderful thing it is. How we should conduct our life. How we should conduct our life. This should be the question in our life. If you call yourselves as Christian, if you call yourselves as pastor or elder or anybody else in the church, what is your life? The life should project what you are. Not that your words. You need not talk. You need not say, say anything about you. I tell you according to me, as what the Bible says, eh, I can tell only one thing. What does the Bible say? You are sinner by birth. You are sinner by deeds. And the wages of sin 
is death. That's the only thing about me. If the Lord Jesus Christ lives, lives in you, if the Lord Jesus Christ is the really head of your life, then you will be able to say, the Lord Jesus Christ loved me and gave himself for me. That's why I am a new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ. My head is the Lord Jesus Christ. My mouth should proclaim the uh, glory of the Lord. My walk should say a great, a wonderful, wonderful reverence to my God. People will see your walk. People will hear your words, what you speak. People will see your attitude. And will they be able to say that you are a child of God? You are a ch child of God. That is important. That is important. See, this beautiful... See, uh, in chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, Colossians chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, what do we read there? This is so wonderful, I tell you, my dear friends. 10 and 11. There we read that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. See, number 1. Walk that is worthy. And number 2. And what do we read there? Eh? Being fruitful in every good work. A life that is pleasing. And the work that is fruitful. Number one, a work that is worthy. Number two, a life that is pleasing. In your life. Number three, a work that is fruitful. Whatever you do, your work should be fruitful. Hmm. And number four, a knowledge that is increasing. What kind of knowledge? Knowing the Lord Jesus Christ is the great, great knowledge. God wants that we should know Him. <laughs> I can say that I knew, I, I knew Him in the year for the first time. In the, in the year 1963, November. 57 years have gone by. But, I should know Him every day. Knowing the Lord Jesus Christ every day is the mission of the children of God, washed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Till the last breath of my life, I want to know Him because my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and He is the eternal God. Everything was created by Him. Everything was created for Him. See? So, knowing Him is eternal thing. Knowing the Lord Jesus Christ is for eternity to eternity. Even when we are gathered together by the Lord Jesus Christ when He comes in the mid-air. When we are caught up in glory, oh, we will be knowing Him for eternity to eternity. I tell you one thing, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ will never, ever end. This is so wonderful. Practice it in this world. Because that is, your, that is your work for eternity to eternity. See, and the knowledge that is increasing, look at that. He says in uh, verses 10 and 11, increasing knowledge, you will know him more and more. I want to know him, that should be the desire. Paul's desire was that, I want to know him, 
and I want to know him the sufferings, his sufferings. I want to know him the experience of his death. What is the reason for this? Because I want to be like him. That should be the desire of our life. And knowledge that is increasing. See, look at that. The next one. A strength that is powerful. As you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be more powerful, more strong. Nothing shall shake you. We read about many men and women of God in the Bible. Hmm. What about Job? Hmm. He, he was a rich man. He was a noble man. He was godly man. The devil asked permission of God to destroy everything of Job. God gave him the permission. God gave him the permission. Do you know why? I will tell you. He gave him the permission and Joe, as devil, Satan, de destroyed everything including his health. And his own wife came and said, curse God and die. Job rebuked his wife. He lost everything. He said one thing, naked I came. And naked I will go. He understood. He came naked. And he has nothing. And then he goes. He goes empty handed. Naked. Praise the Lord he said. What a man of God. And God blessed him abundantly. Whatever he has lost. God added the double portion to it. Our God is a good God. He honors his people like anything. He crowns his people, beloved people, washed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And I tell you one important thing. His beloved people washed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ are the crown of glory on his head. And I tell you another thing. God, the Almighty God, can go to any extent to protect his children. He can do anything. He can destroy the universe in order to protect his children. Because the children of God washed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, they are the apple of God's eye. How much we should praise Him? How much we should worship Him? I told you a strength that is powerful. And the next one, <laughs> the qualities essential in the Christian life. The next one, a patience that is joyful. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He was beaten. He was tortured. He was spit upon. He was nailed to the cross. He was uh, he he uh, uh, he was uh, the the crown of thorns were put on his head. They crushed the thorn into his head. And from the top to the bottom, he was bleeding. And the blood, to the last drop of blood, fell down. He was bleeding from top to bottom. But what happened? What happened? He said, it is finished. What is finished? The salvation of mankind was finished. He shed his huh, last drop of blood for you and me. How much I should be faithful to you? 
how much I should praise Him. Lord, I thank you. This is the eternal song of praise. Thank you for the great salvation that you have given to me. We should repeatedly praise the Lord for this great salvation, great and wonderful salvation, which no one can snatch from his people. And the result of that salvation is the wonderful abode with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'll come and I'll, I'll take you with me. There are many mansions in, in, my, in my house. Mansions, not houses. You know what is the meaning of mansion? Many mansions in my house. I will come back and I will take you to be with me. Look at that. See who is Jesus Christ and who are we? Yes. Have you ever understood this fact? The Lord Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And is the creator of the whole universe. Everything belongs to him. He is the Lord of glory. He is the boss. He is the creator. Who are we? Unworthy people. Dust. Because we see in the Bible, thou art dust and dust, dust shall thou go. But that people, the people of the dust, are becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ. Is the glory of your and my salvation. Do you know that? Then your glory and my glory. The glory. The Lord Jesus Christ has blessed you abundantly, my dear friends. The question is only simple. When I meditate on these things, what God has done in my life, the question came to my heart like this. What do I do for my Savior? For my loving Savior? I shall surrender my entire life so that I may be careful in my life to bring every time glory, honor and praise to my Lord Jesus Christ. Is this your desire? What a wonderful Savior we have in Jesus. What a loving Savior we have in, this, in Jesus. I have not experienced His wrath on me. When I see that, am I worthy for it? No, not at all. I am not a perfect man, but the Lord Jesus looked after me, even today, in this age. He looked after me so lovingly, so wonderfully. How much He has blessed me. Can I forget that? No. I cannot forget what all He has done for me, even today. If at all I am living, it is only because of my Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember one song, All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I give everything. So, my dear friends, if you are really blessed by this message, if you, are, if you have seen the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart today, you will say the same thing. You will sing the same hymn, hymn. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. What else we can do? What can we give to Him? In response, to 
our gratefulness to the Lord. Only we can surrender everything at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord Jesus, I am yours for eternity to eternity. Take me and use me for your glory. Make this simple prayer and say Amen. And the Lord will bless you abundantly. You will see the marvelous change in your life. And wherever you go, whomever, whoever you meet, you will proclaim only one thing. The Lord Jesus loves you. Will you do that? I believe that will, that will be the grateful, grateful thanks, a grateful worship to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us without any conditions, who loved us abundantly, who protected us, who sustained us, who has given us the joy of the Lord. May God richly bless you. God bless you. Amen.